Okay, hello everyone. Um, good morning, good day, um, good afternoon, and good to see you all. Um, and thank you for taking this time. I know you're all busy people um, making an impact in the world, uh, but I'm really excited and happy that we have this chance to, to have a little conversation, to talk about masculinity, what it means to be a maybe queer man in this time and age, the male body experience and so on. And our conversation is kind of connected to, to our coming workshop, I See You, I See Me, where we also talk about what it means to be a queer man in today's uh, society. So, so thank you for being here. Um, I, I thought maybe we should have like a short round of introductions before we get to, I have some questions that then we can go through. Uh, so who wants to go first? Rico, you want to start maybe? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so Rico Jacob Chase, pronouns he, him. I'm a director at Transactional UK. So Transactional UK is run by trans people for trans people. Uh, we advocate, inform and empower trans people. So say, for example, if I encounter someone who's been a victim of hate crime, we'll then use that hate crime synopsis to put it directly into um, a hate crime uh, response to the Law Commission or a synopsis to the UN. So we really try to empower people. Uh, we did a talk recently about um, GP, so GP training, effectively training trans people on how to have those discussions with their GP. Uh, me personally, I do a lot of public speaking in order to raise awareness. I've done consultancy work for the Department of Transport, uh, NHS, and I did, a I did a speech at Parliament recently. Oh, great to meet you. Thank you for having me. And Jason, you wanna go next? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Jason. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm queer non-binary and I am a singer-songwriter. I also work at AKT, the Albert Kennedy Trust, as a youth worker supporting young people, LGBT young people who are experiencing homelessness in the UK. Um, and I'm also a trustee at Male Survivors Partnership, a charity that supports men, boys, non-binary people and trans people who have experienced sexual assault and who are sexual assault survivors. Great, thank you, and welcome. And AJ, you wanna wanna go next? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm AJ Pabial. Pronouns are he and him. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm a portrait painter, and also a founder of my own arts organisation. It's a non profit which is supporting underrepresented young people from London into the creative sector uh, by a cultural every generation. I'm also a civic futures fellow uh, with the GLA, um, kind of looking at the recovery scheme for post COVID. Um, and also a trustee with uh, Create Space. Great. With Create Space. Nice to meet you. Um, maybe I should also give a short introduction of myself. My name is uh, Jani Toivola. Um, I'm based in Helsinki, Finland. Half Finnish, my mother is Finnish and my dad is from Kenya. But I, I lived all my life in, 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 in Finland. Um, I'm an actor, writer, also public speaker. Um, and I also spent eight years as an MP in the Finnish parliament, and I'm the first black member of the Finnish parliament, which I would say is, is it's, it's nice to have that title, but at the same time, it was quite a lonely position to take. Uh, but I guess we need those steps in, 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 in order to break those ceilings and, and move forward in a, in a society. Um, I have a daughter. She's seven years old, goes to first grade, so I'm also a father, which is a important title for me as well. <laughs> and I'm going to be facilitating our coming workshop, uh, I See You, I See Me, next week. Great. But hey, let's go to our first, I have a few questions that I thought to kind of start up the conversation, and, and then we can all sort of go around and share our thoughts and opinions and feelings. So the first question would be, in today's society, what does being a queer man mean to you? And how do you define uh, healthy masculinity? whoever wants to start. So what does it mean to be, for you, a queer man in today's society? I guess I can kick off. Um, I think it's been quite difficult to define what a queer man is for myself. Um, I think it's definitely been a process and a process that I'm still kind of currently exploring. Um, and as someone who's kind of just come across, you know, terms such as boy flux. Um, so if anyone doesn't know what boy flux is, uh, it's someone who, identifies as being uh, mostly or completely male uh, and sometimes has their very degrees of um, kind of identities as well. So um, trying to kind of pinpoint one definition has been a bit of a challenge, but 
uh, for myself, when I think about being a queer man, it's I think of comfort, uh, comfort within my own skin and being kind of um, being able to kind of express who I'm as an individual, um, whether that's kind of mentally or physically as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's I think it's a definition that's always kind of changing for me, but uh, I guess that's always going to be different for uh, other people, especially within the room right now. Oh well, okay. Oh uh, well, I think I think as well. Like just to add on to that, um, I guess in a similar way, um, I think being a queer man for me is, it's again, it's for me, it is, it is, it is a flux, a fluctuation between um, kind of identity. Um, but to me, I think what it means to me and what it means to the rest of the world also really defines how I relate to my queerness and my identity as well. I think when I'm thinking about um, who I am, in a way it, that really doesn't matter to the rest of the world, but at the same time, what the rest of the world thinks I am also doesn't matter to me. So at the same time, like being a queer, um, a queer person basically doesn't matter, but at the same time, it really matters just depending on what perspective I'm looking at it. Mm, interesting. And if I can add another question, do you feel that when you said that you don't if I understood correctly, that you feel like it, it doesn't matter to you what the outside world kind of thinks about you or your identity. How yeah. firm do you feel you are in that? Or is it something that's kind of changing depending on, on, the, on the day? <laughs> I think there are two layers because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what um, people think about my identity, but at the same time, because of me having to survive, it does matter. And the way I am affected by the way I am treated for um, my gender identity, and that does matter to me. Um, but when I'm thinking about the essence of who I am, that is something that's completely internal and personal to me. Right. Yeah, so I'm a trans guy, so I had to completely work out who I am and define masculinity for myself. And I realized that um, I'd always encounter situations where I wasn't masculine enough. Like I'll end up speaking to straight girls and they'll say, oh, you're a guy. And I was like, yeah, it's like, you're not like macho, macho. I was like, well, it, it doesn't make me feel like less of a guy. Like, do I have to adopt that toxic masculinity perception in order to even consider myself eligible for this um, masculine criteria? And I realized when I first came out as um, trans, I did adopt a lot of that trust masculinity. It's like, oh yeah, let's go out and get the girls. Like, because that's what you are seeing on um, social media or the, the men that are sort of praised or amplified in like music. And those are the ones that kind of have, have that negative um, <laughs> toxic masculinity traits. And I realized actually, who am I? Like I was raised by my brother and my, my, my father and they're not like that. So that's the masculinity I should try and be. I should try and be a provider, sort of carer, not adopting the 1950 perceptions, but that's more who I am. That's who I should be. But yeah, it was a journey basically, because there's, there's no, I mean, Obama's good, but when it comes to being sort of black and male, we're not really um, out there as much. So I kind of had to redefine it for myself. Mm, yes. Yeah, I can, I can totally relate. If I think about it for myself, I think it's at the same time, it's kind of like it's it's about freedom, but it's also about re restrictions and limitations and this kind of like a narrowness kind of go side by side. And I think for me, it's like if I think about masculinity or queer masculinity, that somehow almost all my life, I, I know, always kind of thought that I'm outside masculinity, that I'm not like a man enough. But then now really lately, like the past year, I've all of a sudden started to think that that what if I was always the one who was like on the inside? <laughs> you know what I mean? That 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 then I when I talk to a lot of my my, for example, straight male friends, and it feels like they are a lot more limited actually than I am. So, so kind of like growing up on the outside, but at the same time being more free to define myself on my own terms <laughs> than those who were maybe originally more at the core of of this very narrow definition of, of masculinity. I don't know how you guys feel, but. Yeah, I just want to echo what Rico was saying in terms of how that's always forever changing. And I, I definitely see how my masculinity is kind of in flux and depending on the situation that, that I'm in um, or the kind of settings that I'm in. Uh, and I think as a queer person, we've come to learn 
what I've come to learn how I could almost use that as my advantage sometimes uh, to feel safe in certain spaces, but also which can be quite detrimental because that's not kind of your true self. Um, so just just an example. Um, so I've just recently taken up boxing and boxing can be a very kind of very masculine sport. Uh, and someone who doesn't really identify being very masculine, uh, I feel like I'm kind of switching the masculine switch on every time I'm in the ring or if I'm kind of training. And as soon as I stop training, I just kind of revert back to someone who is kind of less masculine. Um, it's a very interesting kind of situation. It kind of feels like I could turn it off and on. And I think, you know, when we talk about safety, sometimes we can switch that on as individuals if we need to feel safe within a certain space. But for us, that's not our true authentic selves. And I think that could be quite difficult to manage sometimes. Um, and especially like working within kind of in a working environment as well you know kind of I can talk from a kind of creative and cultural kind of uh, sectors kind of uh, perspective is that it's very male dominated and sometimes going into meetings is very it's a very male dominated space and then I'm having to kind of manage how I'm presenting myself and my masculinity within that space do if I kind of present myself as a bit more feminine are they going to take me seriously um, so it's always a kind of always interchanging thing and I think it can, yeah, it just can be quite difficult to manage sometimes. Right, yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that experience also through being a queer father. And when I go to, for example, the school community, and I feel like before we enter the school area, I kind of know who I am as a father and where my place is, and, and, I, and I trust that. But then very easily when we, when we kind of become part of the school community, all of a sudden there is this like more narrow restrictions and then that also kind of affects my parenting. Like all of a sudden I feel a lot more shakier in a way that am I good enough and can I really protect her? And who am I supposed to be as a father, you know, kind of looking at the other fathers on the ground or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to add um, to that point is that as queer people, we are hyper aware of masculinity um, in the same way that we are um, as people of color. Um, Kind of hyper aware of our race and you know when we're talking about gender and sexuality there's things that we think about all the time because every time we enter a space that is straight um automatically as ages said we, we flip switches to see how we can assimilate to survive um so i think you know being queer is very joyous but at the same time it's also very tricky and it's very dangerous at times too um, and so, you know, I've been in situations where I've had to alter my mannerisms, what I wear, the words I choose to use, um, things like that, just to almost not put myself in a situation that could be precarious. Um, so then my masculinity becomes, um, you know, something that, you know, I internally can celebrate, but externally is actually detrimental to my, um, to my existence. Yes, yes. Okay, maybe we should move to the to the next question. Um, so, in the queer community, what do you think are the most common expectations that men put on themselves? Elaborate maybe on your own experiences, and what other barriers uh, currently surround masculinity? How do your other intersectional identities like race, religion, cultural background, and gender interact with your own masculinity? So, That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, um, there's, a, there's a lot. Sorry. You can just touch on something, yeah. I would say yeah, expressing I... emotions. Like, ironically, I mean, I, I was raised a girl, so for the first 25 years of my life, I was quite comfortable expressing my emotions. But suddenly, as I sort of came to terms with my trans identity, I almost felt as if I had to suppress it. Like, is it appropriate to sort of express emotion here or to to cry or when I wake up in the morning I prance around like an idiot like every morning I prance around but then I felt oh am I being less masculine am I sort of uh, am I giving people the wrong impression and it's actually probably taken me about a year to be comfortable enough with my own masculinity to start expressing emotions again to say I feel like this because um societal pressure on men is it's really it's really quite harsh actually um and yeah, that's something else I wanted to say, but I don't quite remember. <laughs> I would say people tend to listen to you more. I would be questioned left, right, and center um, as a woman in professional environments. As a guy, 
I just say things and no one no one questions it. I mean, I, I know myself it's true, but people are like, oh, where did you get that for? Are you sure? You know, um, I get stared at a lot less. Um, but you always end up getting objectified in public. You're like an object. As a guy, you're entirely invisible. People tend not to notice you at all. So there's a lot of different changes between the different sexes. Um, and I would say the expectation to sort of pay for things, um, to earn enough, like we tend to be measured on our achievements and our income as opposed to our, our caliber and character. And I think that's been something which has been difficult to sort of navigate. Mm. Yeah, I guess like um, Rika, you brought two really interesting things up of like expectation from you know other people when they put their assumptions onto us, but also um, the privilege some of us have as well. Um, so you know, as someone who is um, kind of male presenting to the world, um, and people when they look at me, they're like, oh, you know, this must be a guy kind of thing. Uh, as an non-binary person, that puts me in a situation where I'm like, do I then play into those assumptions or do I have to act a certain way based on expectation? Or, you know, if I don't, am I kind of disturbing the norm too much and putting myself in jeopardy, right? Um, but also at the same time, yeah, like, you know, the, it's hard to know how to act sometimes because there isn't really a script um, for being queer. Um, there's just been a lot of survival that we've gone through. And so there isn't anything that we can do that is kind of normal, unless if we play into the assumptions and stereotypes that have been put on us by heteronormative society. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll move on to the other points in a bit. Maybe AJ wants to add in at this point. Yeah, I was just kind of thinking in terms of, you know, how masculinity is presented. And I think, you know, there's the men mentality that, that kind of manifests and also the physical uh, appearances as well. And I think I was just thinking about tribes, for example, you know, within the kind of the game uh, community, we kind of almost kind of start uh, kind of categorizing people's bodies based on a certain tribal because they have, you know, they may be a bit, uh, a bit bigger and a bit hairy than, you know, suddenly they're a bear or they're a bit slim and they kind of, you know, a bit more kind of youthful looking, they're, they're a twink. And I think that's that could be so dangerous for us to kind of almost force us to categorize our, our bodies and ourselves based on how we present ourselves. And I think as an individual myself, it's just, um, I'm a bit more built when it comes when it comes to my body, but then also I get kind of signposted into these or kind of pigeonholed into to be a certain person when actually I'm not. Um, and that could be quite difficult to manage. Is kind of like, do I need to start thinking like what other people kind of expect of me? Um, and that be quite that can be quite challenging. And someone who, you know, when we talk about body image, as uh, someone who's South Asian and growing up, when I was, you know, discovering my queerness, the images that I was present presented was was white males, uh, very cisgendered, um, and someone who didn't kind of identify with that. Almost, I had to kind of modify my body. Uh, to be at least recognized. Uh, so, so I was a bit kind of uh, a bit on the, on the weighty side when I was a bit younger, but I had to, cause the reason I started working out initially was for appearances only to be kind of be presentable or kind of catch someone else's eye or kind of feel like I, I can be worthy of someone else's gaze. Um, and that was quite difficult to manage because obviously I couldn't change my skin color, um, but I could have done things to modify my body to become integrated within the community that I thought was kind of one way um, but that has a, that's kind of changed over time um, but it's, it's just been very interesting to see how um, so just in terms of the past year where I just kind of lost a lot of weight and kind of gained a bit of muscle the conversations that people have engaged with me has completely changed um, people that's so embarrassing um, but <laughs> but the conversations have completely changed it's kind of like the people approaching me are very very different um, and it's like we were talking about being objectified that's suddenly become that you know I've become objectified in that process um, which has been quite nice to get that attention but at the same time you start to realize wow was it really that mm. Yeah, I guess to, just to add to your point about tribes as well, I think there's something um, like we should, we have to recognize about the patriarchy of power dynamics. And when you're thinking about the hierarchy of masculinity, you know, the more masculine you are, the more power you hold in a situation. And it's the more power you hold over someone who is less masculine than you as well. And I think that's in a way how the gay um, kind of tribes system exists, right? It's, it is a system of control. It's a system of categorizing you to fit within a patriarchal mold that has already 
existed for so long. Um, and I guess just to bring in as well, um, kind of my race identity as well, you know, growing up in Hong Kong, my spectrum for masculinity is very different to the one practiced or believed in in the UK, right? So, you know, the way I act and present is very different to people in Hong Kong versus people in London. You know, um, when I'm back in Hong Kong, people don't think I'm feminine, but here I am extremely feminine, right? Mm -hmm. So there, we have to kind of acknowledge that um, immigrants and people who've moved to um, different parts of the world experience very different cultural differences when it comes to defining masculinity or kind of where you are in a sliding scale. Um, and again, you know, as AJ says, like, I was taught, you know, through TV, media, um, that kind of the goal was to be a cis white man with abs, right? And that is something that is not achievable. But I would grow up with, you know, my friends who are Chinese, who are Korean, Japanese, Thai, I'm like from all over the world who would say, oh, I wish I had blue eyes, you know? And that is such a harrowing thought to think that people, you know, are kind of wanting to be white because whiteness represents so much and is so much in this world and is the in the hierarchy, the system of control. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And something that I can also relate to from my own background, like growing up in Finland, which is like 97% white. Um, so the, the experience throughout my life has almost always been that I'm the only person in the room. So you never have even like a single mirror <laughs> that would kind of reflect to you your own identity so also being a young 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 queer man i i remember wanting to have white <laughs> white hair and blue eyes and and very different from from who i am and that's a big big conflict uh, to to carry at the same time when you're trying to grow up and, and build your identity and, and kind of carry that shame all the time yeah definitely Rico, uh, so go oh, sorry, so to add like a, fi a final bit about the tribe thing um, is, you know, yes, we are kind of defined um, through how masculine we are in our physical um, kind of attributes, but at the same time, like when it comes to being a POC, I don't really get classified as anything else but being Asian a lot of the time. Like I am just Asian um, and it doesn't matter what my physique is. It doesn't matter what my sexual preferences are. A lot of time I'm categorized as that because that itself comes with a lot of um, connotations and labels that people want to put onto me to be a specific way. And when we're talking about, you know, um, an East Asian, um, you know, male, um, there are already so many stereotypes attached to it. you're supposed to be submissive, you're supposed to be weak, you're supposed to, um, you know, be subservient. Um, and these are things that I have to battle every day to not allow people to put on to me because history has allowed that to happen through colonization and i have always been seen as you know inferior or not attractive um or weak and so when it comes to being a queer person there are a lot of labels that i actively have to fight before i can put my own labels onto myself yeah thank you thank you for sharing um should we move on to the next question? It's kind of the final final round. Let's move. Um, as leaders in your own right, what suggestions can you give others who want to invite these courageous conversations in their daily lives or their organizations and their communities? How do you create space for vulnerability, intimacy, and self-love as a queer man? Um, for sure, you all have something to say about this. Rico, do you want to start or? That's a massive question. <laughs> um, it's a massive question because, um, I mean, those are sort of questions I'm asking myself on a daily basis in the sense of who I am and how do I sort of perpetuate self-love because I was raised, I mean, I went to private school. My parents worked ridiculously hard in private school, so I was the, pretty much one of the few black faces there. and. As a result, I'm very, very comfortable in, um, ironically, um, Hindu or Muslim or um, all white settings, but I haven't really had much, uh, that many black friends growing up. I went to an international university, so I'm always thinking, am I black enough? You know, I'm not quite white enough, I'm not quite, but I'm not quite black enough, so I'm kind of like in the middle, 
and as my job is to talk about um, Black Lives Matter and to talk about the history, the more I look at the history, I'm like, oh, am I betraying my ancestors by sitting in these settings and not necessarily understanding what it is, quote unquote, to be black? So there's a lot of identity and a lot of conflict that kind of comes to, with it. Um, so to be honest with you, it's, it's very, very difficult to even come out with a simple solution um, for that question. Um, but I would say self-love, respecting individuality, embracing individuality. Um, if you are, I guess if you're an employee and you have a minority hire, um, realize that that minority is actually part of the global majority. POCs are in the global majority, so they're not the minority. They just happen to be the only one that you've bothered to hire. <laughs> so don't make them feel like the minority. Um, and I would say that a lot of the, the holidays in professional environments do tend to be centered on Christian holidays. There's more than just Christian holidays. You, know, mm-hmm. you should embrace and uh, understand other people's cultures. Um, and yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a difficult one because I have, I have this conversation with myself like very much once a week. <laughs> um, but yeah, I see what the other panelists have to say. Yes, thank you. And maybe it's in, in, in general just to, to also encourage people just to have these conversations and maybe at least what I'm trying to say to myself a lot of times is to kind of to approach other queer men, for example, and open up these conversations because I notice that I still have this tendency to have the dialogue by myself very easily because <laughs> it's something that you're maybe used to also in your history, kind of being isolated and alone but to, to re- re-encourage people to... Also, sorry, just quickly, just to add to that, I feel as if when it comes to POC communities, they are less understanding of the queer dialogue due to colonialism. Mm. So it's almost as if we are, we still have the cultural upbringing that we're raised with, but we also don't necessarily have as much support um, in our adult lives with our own community. So therefore, as much as we want to date and socialize and flourish in our own communities it does come with a certain element of a certain caveat which can get quite exhausting so even if we do necessarily want to be in our own settings it's may not necessarily 100 be possible or it's it's something more draining than we would well we, we would like to admit so that's another thing that kind of just factors into it thank you jason you want to add yeah um, I guess in terms of kind of furthering the conversation, um, I would um, kind of invite people to have this conversation as, as Rico has um, has touched upon more internally and just speak to yourself about what it means to be masculine for yourself and try to remove that from what people are putting onto you or expecting of you or how you're expressing yourself to the world. Because um, I think when it comes to that type of conversation, it is something that's quite personal to you and will forever be changing. Um, and what it means to you is the most important and is what it is. And at the same time, also think about, you know, how does my, you know, identity relate to my masculinity, but at the same time, like how does my race and my religion and everything relate to the way I present myself or the way I feel and the way I am um, before you start kind of looking at the external of like how now do people perceive me because I think um, if we're trying to form our kind of the expression of our identity externally without looking within first we start buying into and feeding into other people's um, kind of assumptions and um, kind of pigeonholing of who they want us to be instead of us really understanding who we want to be before we present ourselves to the world. Yeah that's a great point. AJ. Yeah, um, it's quite, yeah, it's quite, again, like Rico said, it's a big question to kind of tackle and not kind of answer. And I think as an individual, what I've started to do more of is just be my true authentic self and in all the spaces that I'm entering and especially within the workplace. And, um, I, you know, representation matters. And I didn't understand the power of representation until I was in a position where I was kind of leading change, uh, running an arts organization, uh, especially not for profit as a queer South Asian man like that's not something I grew up seeing um, so when I was in that position I had other younger people coming up to me and saying oh I didn't know you could do this I could do it too 
And I think that's so important to have those kind of honest conversations, but also talk about the barriers that you're facing. And I think just generally within kind of startup culture, we tend to think of, we tend to talk about our successes, uh, the, the great things about working for yourself, et cetera, but we don't talk about the difficulties that comes with it. And I think a lot of those difficulties can stem from kind of personal, personal barriers. And someone who's as South Asian or queer, um, you know, there's navigating those spaces can be very difficult. Um, kind of in previous workspaces, I've made it kind of my personal mission to be as authentically open and expressive as much as possible so the people around me know me for who I am. Yeah, I guess just to add to AJ's point, you know, as as much time as we take to educate other people, I think we should also, um, on the flip side, take a lot of time to learn and diversify the different types of spaces that we inhabit and actually, you know, learn about how other people um, experience masculinity and femininity and their queerness and not only to understand other people's experiences but also to see how that informs your own um, as AJ was saying about like just like exploring who you are um, but not always having to do the work but actually you know being more passive in situations where you're able to see other people's experiences and learn their stories um, and empathize with them and their experiences so that you can also think about how that affects yours. Great. That's a good point to kind of end. Uh, thank you all for, for giving your time. Um, and like we said, there's a lot of sort of ways to go with the questions, but I, I think we touched up on some very interesting and important points. And maybe somehow to bring it back to, to the platform where we are now, I think also spaces like we create space are crucial and important where we can, as the queer community, come together and kind of learn and explore what it means when we are in the same room. <laughs> when we come together still with different kind of identities. And, and that's a good also platform to both kind of educate, but also to listen and learn and explore. Uh, uh, so I think that's also a big important tool for all of us. But thank you so much for, for taking your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.